Every day, history just always fuels my creativity. Because for all of the work that I make, I love to tell stories. Storytelling is really what gets me into art. And history is nothing but stories. What I really love about history are the little stories that are a little weird and that kind of help you to get to understand the time and place a little bit more intimately. For example, in this small little ink study, the death toll was so catastrophic that the Pope had to consecrate the river in Avignon so that people could be given a Christian burial by being just dumped in. And in this case, a lot of the superstitious people believed that a comet before the plague broke out foretold the whole thing. I'm taking a trip now in Boston, Massachusetts, and with so much history everywhere I go here, I thought I'd take some time and research some of the local history. I found a book on the settlement of colonial America, and I found a great quote by one of the first agricultural writers in American history, actually. His name is Jared Elliott, and he talked about a period when there were so many sheep that they ate all of the natural grass, and they just kept multiplying and multiplying, and they solved the problem by bringing in alien strands of grass he says, natural stock of grazing animals hath outgrown the meadow. I pictured like popcorn popping in a pot, growing and growing and growing. Rather than just Googling Massachusetts history, I Googled Concord history, Concord history, colonial America. I had to keep my search as broad as possible and gradually narrowed down. In any local small town, in any small community, there's kooky, weird history stories everywhere. Google led me to a book that we then went to the library to check out and research some passages of, and that's what led me to this great story of the massive overpopulation of sheep. I knew we had to take a trip to Drumlin Farm. There I had some great time, got to see a bunch of little sheep and pet them and like do some sketches of them. While, as I said, I don't want these to be textbook historically accurate, I want them to be funny and intimate, but I also want to get things like the architecture and the costuming and the clothing as accurate as I can. There's a great phrase with character design where your first sketch should always be straight from your imagination. Then your second sketch should be fueled by reference photos, by history, and by research. And then your third sketch lands somewhere in between. So while the style of these images is fairly simplistic, the sketches and the history and the research I do behind them definitely isn't. My whole plague series, I naturally couldn't hop onto a plane and go check out Edinburgh Castle just any time I wanted to. But for this case, I was in Massachusetts with the opportunity to see sheep. So the question is, why was it still worth it to go out and sketch them myself? Google, you always get the most filtered out images. And that doesn't mean they're necessarily bad, but it keeps you from pointing out the intimate things that you notice. But here, when I was looking at the sheep, like noticing their fluff and how they walk and things like that, like how they have a weirdly flat upper face and how they have like a nice cool little sheep butt that kind of like waddles a little bit when they run around. The movement of the younger sheep running faster around the older sheep. So first I did a bunch of thumbnail sketches before I even went to the farm. And for these, I don't really focus on a lot of the details. I just kind of want to block in the major shapes of what I want the image to look like. It wasn't until we got to the farm that I started to do sketches of the, let's call it the character of the sheep. And I was just drawing all the sheep running around and kind of trying to get the sense and feel that I wanted my drawing to capture of them. And it's funny where what I think is like my worst drawing of the sheep, this little one, almost like a jelly bean-ish quality for the body, which kind of fits the humor of my original thumbnail concept. I always like to do the thumbnails detailed enough so that I know what I'm about to do, but not so detailed that I don't have fun in the drawing. The image I have in my head is a colonial farmer climbing up to the top of a tree to avoid the mass of sheep all around him. Sometimes the case happens where you have terrible thumbnails until the final. Sometimes you have a couple good things from each thumbnail and then you kind of compile them all together. And from there I think I have, through this thumbnail, previous thumbnails I've done, and then sketches of the characters, enough information that I need to guide the process of my final drawing. The pen I'll be using is a Rapidograph pen, and they're comparable to the kind of Micron drawing pens, but these you can really count on to get a nice, consistent line. And the best thing about it is the pen is permanent, and all you do is unscrew and refill the cartridge with the ink itself. And the ink can come in different colors, all waterproof. It does, when you're refilling it, have a tendency to leak, as you can probably see from my hands already, but really easy to clean up, rub it with paper towel, they cost a little bit more than your average pen would, 
but it's really the kind of thing you can count on and depend on to make the kind of work that you want. To make the ink wash for these drawings, you start with a basic setup of four different tubs of water. One, you keep as a full, nearly clean, clean enough bucket of water. And then the rest you fill with very small amounts of water. We're talking a fourth to half an ounce. Higgins is great because it has a little eyedropper, but for really cheap you can pick up some eyedroppers yourself if you get another kind of ink. Light, medium, and dark. And then, with the nearly clean water to mostly clean out your brush, you can make more subtle color shades between that. So in the first one, with the most water, I'm going to put in only a couple drops of the ink. For the second one, with the same amount of water, I'll put in about double the amount of ink. And then for the third one, we're really going to go crazy with the ink on this one. And the key is you always have the bottle of ink at your disposal, so that is your darkest dark, that's your true black. And then you have your clean water and the white of the paper, which is your lightest light. See how that keeps mostly the light of the paper shining through? And Already you're seeing it's much darker, but especially as we get to the bottom and it pools down, you can see that it's not quite as pure dark as actual ink will be. Here at the darkest shade, we can really see the nice pooling of the dark ink in there. Even that is not as dark as we can go, and you can see how that one, even compared to the darkest value we've made, is still completely pitch black. With all of these combined, dipping your brush in the water, that's how you can even bring in even more value into the piece. Not to mention, as you can hopefully see, some really cool bleeding work. I'm using some hot press watercolor paper. I just really like the texture it feels. It really lets the ink pool well. So I start by getting some artist tape, taping the paper down. For these pieces, I like to keep them at such a small size, the kind of drawing that doesn't take days or weeks to do, but the kind of thing that I can do in one day with a little bit of focus. I'm going to translate the thumbnail into what I'll call the final pencil sketch. And we want to keep this light because we are going to erase all of this before we apply the ink. That's a really important step with making an ink wash drawing like this. While your ink line can overcome the pencil, once you apply the layer of ink wash, that creates a seal where you can no longer erase your pencil marks behind it. So to keep it nice and clean, you like to even erase the pencil so it's nearly invisible before you start applying the wash and applying the ink line. We're going to want to erase the pencil lines because once you start using the ink wash over, you can't erase the pencil from underneath that. Just a simple Mars plastic eraser, because you want to use the side because you don't want to erase too much of the image. You want to still keep a light, subtle, let's call it a ghost of an image underneath it. So you can still see where your pencil line was, but these aren't going to be obtrusive when you start applying the ink wash. Some of them I'm making up new lines and cleaning up the lines that I made prior. Whether you put a lot of pressure or a very light touch, you get the same line thickness. So if you want to go the route of purchasing Rapidograph, they do come in different line weight qualities. The downside with that is that you can't with one pen really easily make a lot of different stroke sizes. Since the whole point of these images for me is to make a comical, almost childish approach to history, I want the line to be very simple, very straightforward. So I'm working on the facial expression of the sheep. I want very clear to make them seem not malicious or in any way attacking the farmer, merely inconveniencing the farmer. When I was hanging out with the sheep, I love like the sheep's eyeball, which I'm not choosing to depict here, but it does have a like kind of look to it. Before I do the ink wash, I want to get rid of any stray pencil marks that are there. So Rapidograph dries pretty quickly, give it a hot minute to go through, and then just erase all those leftover pencil marks. Start with a wash of just plain water, and then follow through with the lightest ink that I made. And that way the bleed of the water will assist the ink into making some really cool subtle textures. There's definitely a world that's being made here. A world where the sheep are piling up. It's a comical, unrealistic world. So you don't want to spend the time to make something look really fresh and pristine, or it won't work well together. You have to, at all times, make sure you're making a concise drawing in a concise world with your work. I always like to have a paper towel or a rag or something handy, just so that I can dab away 
at the excess water because I don't want it to spread through to cover parts of the drawing that I want to remain light and highlighted. Now the reason that I boxed out in the center here and left some paper open and free on the sides is so that I can still kind of test and make like a little palette on the paper on the side to get an accurate look of what the ink shade is going to look like before I commit to applying it. Because the great thing about ink is that it's a lot of fun to work with, but the downside is it's incredibly unforgiving. Whatever comes on stays on. In general, for the whole piece, I will go light to dark. Because again, ink is unforgiving, so you can always make something darker by adding more ink, but you'll never be able to bring it back from dark. And so even if, like in this case, I have an idea that the shepherd's costume is going to be very dark gray, not quite black, but a dark gray. So I could lay that in right now. But since I haven't mapped out any of the rest of the value structure, I don't want it to really mess with the rest of the piece. So I'm still going to do this in layers to slowly get on board with that. My goal with the shadows is not to make them too standoffish. Sometimes dramatic works really well for these, but for this one I want the mood to be safe, I want it to be welcoming and comforting, midday, soft lighting, a little bit of cloud coverage, because I want the shadows to be there to make it feel like a real place, but I definitely don't want it to seem very over dramatic. My knowledge of lighting came mostly from like a almost drawing boot camp that I worked on in sophomore year, where all of our assignments had a specific time of day and a light source. And so with enough study, you can always kind of mimic things in a way that is accurate. Everything always has to go back to direct observation. So much of it came from a study of direct observation, whether it was from the sheep specifically studying for this piece or a lifetime's worth of studying lighting so far. What I'm doing to get the texture for the sheep wool is using a bleed. And this is the same kind of technique I used for the sky, where I started with the wash of plain water and then followed up with the lightest tone of gray. The difference for this one is I'm starting with the lightest tone of gray and following up with a middle tone almost instantly. And what that does is the dark gray kind of pools through from where I place it and the point of origin and it slowly recedes out. So it helps to make a really nice subtle gradient in there, which really helps to translate the soft fluffy texture of the little sheet butt. All right, so that's it. It took a couple hours with work, some ink wash work, rapidograph work, a lot of playing around and sketching sheep, which was a blast. And yeah, this is the kind of project where you can do a couple a week and it's just a lot of fun to learn more, to practice more, and then in the end have a piece that you're pretty happy with. Woo! Cool. Sweet! <laughs> <laughs> oh, much will be said about the sheep butts. <laughs>